A Shot in the Dark by Silverpup. Chapter 45. Thorn froze for exactly five seconds before responding with a passion that surprised him. The king cupped his cheek with one hand while the other laced through his hair and tilted his head back until the angle was perfect. Bilbo relaxed and leaned closer as he released Thorn's braids in favor of the rest of his hair. Sadly, he didn't get to enjoy the lovely experience for very long as laughter and groans interrupted them. Ah, I won! Pay up! All of ya! Really, Thorin? You couldn't wait until we got back to Erebor before modeling Bilbo? You lost me my weight! I won the other one! But liked it first! You won what? Ugh, oh, uncle, no one wanted to see that. Bever, stop with the gestures! Thorin doesn't need any more ideas! I'm disappointed in you, cousin. I thought you would at least have the courage to make the first move. Is it really a surprise, though? This is Bilbo we're talking about here! I could have lived the rest of my life without watching my uncle shove his tongue down our burglar's throat. Enough chatter, I want my gold from you all. Oh, shut up, Nane. It's not as if you need the gold. Green is an ugly color on your toilet. Not that you can get much uglier than you are now. Is Bilbo standing on his boots? Huh. I didn't think he was that short. Bilbo groaned and buried his face against Thorin's shoulder as he tried to ignore the peanut gallery behind them. I should have seen this coming. Dead. They're all dead. The king growled, his hand sliding down to cup the hobbit's waist. If you kill them, then who is going to clean up the dragon droppings in Erebor? He reminded the warrior, smiling against the leather and iron. The dwarf sniffed. I'll hire the men of Lake Town. They won't mind as long as I pay them well. Oh, like Bard is going to let you anywhere near his people after you threw them out. He scoffed, lifting his head to give the other a dirty look. You still owe them an apology, by the way. Bard in particular. Thorin looked as if he would rather face Smog and Azog again at the same time. It has been brought to my attention that I may have been unfair to him. You accused him of trying to steal me away from you, Bilbo reminded him, not feeling an ounce of pity for the king. Then you broke your word and threw him and his men out of Erebor. The same men who then went to war on your behalf in order to protect Erebor from your enemies. You owe him an apology, the Arkenstone, and a new city. Can't I give him some gold and call it even? The king groused, looking down at him with bleeding blue eyes. Bilbo still wasn't moved. Thorin, he saved my life, he said quietly, closing his eyes as he thought back to his friend. He was willing to follow me to Mordor, even though he was wounded and weak. He nearly died trying to give me time to escape the Nazgul. I owe him everything. I, I suppose I was unfair to him, the dwarf admitted slowly, looking pained by the admission. He did not, he did nothing to deserve my ire or hate. It was my own madness that drove me to think the worst of him and his men. Yes, it was, he agreed, opening his eyes to meet Thorin's gaze. There is nothing but friendship between Bard and I. He's... I think of him the same way you think of Dwalin, as my brother and friend. His admission made Thorin look even more bad. Fine, fine, I get it. I made a mistake. I'll apologize to him. Eventually. Good. He gave Thorn's braids a playful tug and patted the hand still holding his waist. Now let me go so you can go and yell at our friends. Thorn squeezed the flesh in his hands before allowing him to step back and off of his boots. Once free, he stepped aside as the king emerged over to the group of dwarves grumbling and exchanging cold and proceeded to yell at them in custom. As the group descended into chaos, Bilbo reached up and traced his lips with his fingers and wondered idly if his face was as happy as he felt. <laughs> At the first sight of Mirkwood, Bilbo thought he was hallucinating. Is that Mirkwood? Have we already arrived? He asked Keely, who walked close to him. Keely nodded with an amused smile. Yes, we've reached Mirkwood. Why so surprised? You knew we were heading there first. I guess I expected the journey to last longer, he admitted, biting his lower lip in thought. Are we going through it to get to Erebor? Yes, the men we hired will be returning to their kingdoms while the elves will lead us through Mirkwood to get back to Erebor, the prince explained, pushing some of his wild hair out of his face. Oh, do you think Thranduil will allow me to visit Tariel, Bjorn, and Bard? He wondered quietly, fiddling with one of his beads. Keely shrugged. Sure, why not? They're your friends. You can't stop that. No, but I did nearly get his captain of the guard killed, Bilbo pointed out. 
From what I remember, it was her choice to go with you. The dwarf reminded with Ephraim. He can't hold you responsible for her injuries. But he can keep me away from her in order to protect her from the trouble I seem to bring, he retorted, feeling his heart twist at the thought of never seeing the elf again. Keely shook his head stubbornly and ended up making his messy hair even messier. No, I won't let him. You're friends, and you should be allowed to see her. Bobo smiled and reached up to fix the prince's messy locks. Thank you, Keely. I appreciate that. The brunette beamed and leaned into his touch. Of course, anything for my new uncle. I haven't married Thorn yet, he reminded, rolling his eyes with a fond smile. But you are going to marry him, the prince pushed with a grin. He shrugged and finally gave up on trying to tame Keely's hair. It really did have a mind of its own. Sure, once he beats my grandmother in a drinking contest. Keely stopped and stared. What? He has to do that? Bilbo grinned and kept walking. Of a tradition. If he wants to marry me, then he has to outdrink my family. If he does, then I'll marry him. Behind him, Keely began to laugh so hard that he needed Belfer to hold him up. They reached the beginning of Mirkwood just as the sun was setting. As the dwarves began to set camp alongside the elves, Bilbo decided to hunt down Dane in order to ask him to take him to Thranduil. Now why would you want to go see that tree hugger? The dwarf lord asked, raising one of his brows high in judgment. Because I need his permission to see my friends, he explained calmly, raising his hands on his hips. Dane's judging eyebrow rose another inch. Aha! Uh-huh. And why are you coming to me exactly? Why not go to Thorin? Or someone who actually likes you? Because Thorin might try to rip his head off if he refuses to give you permission, he explained, rolling his eyes. And what happened to your one-sided love for me? I thought it was everlasting. It died a miserable death when you ran off to Mardar and made my cousins chase after you with my army, the dwarf dead band. But that's your point. It would be better to keep Thorin away from that prick. All right, Bagler, come along then. I'll take you to see the marble statue. Dane led him through the camps until they stood in front of the airy and elegant tent that he recognized as Thranduil's. The two guards stationed in front eyed them with obvious suspicion, but still granted them access once Dane told them his name. Inside the tent, they found Thranduil standing with a parchment in his hand, while Legolas sat nearby on a pile of cushions with his sword and a whetstone in his lap. At their entrance, Legolas looked up and went wide-eyed, while Thranduil continued to read his parchment as if they weren't there. Lord Dane, Master Baggins, the prince said in greeting, glancing at his father before looking back to them. What brings you here so late? The Marglar here wanted to see your father, answered Dane as he reached behind him and pulled Bilbo forward by his wrist. He stumbled and threw a glare over his shoulder at the dwarf who merely smirked back at him. Thranduil still did not look away from his letter. Legolas glanced at Bilbo and then back at his father. Father? Finally, at his son's quiet plea, the king dropped the letter onto the table in front of him and turned his blank eyes to the hobbit. Bilbo raised his chin and forced himself to meet the unnerving days without flinching. Halfling, you have caused quite a mess with your foolish actions, the elf commented, his voice as even and cool as ever. A great deal of my people perished trying to rescue you. Even my captain nearly paid the ultimate price just for helping you. Bilbo nodded slowly. I know. She is the reason I'm here. I was hoping... I was hoping you would allow me to visit her and the other two you saved with her. Thranduil's eyes grew hooded and lighter like frost spreading across a lake. So that you may drag her into another situation where she may risk her life for you. I didn't mean for her to get hurt, he said quietly, lacing his fingers behind his back in order to hide the way they were shaking. If I could switch places with her in a heartbeat, I would. But you can't, the king reminded, his winter eyes never thawing, and Tario will now be scarred and blind for the rest of her eternal life. He felt his heart stop. What? She's lost her sight, Huffling. Thranduil repeated slowly, as if speaking to a small child. The Uliari slashed her across the face. The wound runs from ear to ear, and has stolen her sight from her forevermore. By the time we found her, it was too late to save her eyes. Oh. 
Bilbo felt like he was about to throw up. He knew his friends had been greatly injured, but to actually hear about it in detail made it suddenly more real. He tried to imagine Tariel, beautiful and brave Tariel with her flashing hazel eyes, with the injury described and wanted to weep. And now you come here asking me to allow you to see her. The elf spat, his lips curling back into what looked like a cross between a snarl and a sneer. As if I would allow you so close to her again. As if I did not wish to strike your head from your shoulders. Enough, Thranduil! Dane suddenly growled, interrupting the king. He stepped forward and gently nudged the hobbit behind him until he stood between Thranduil and Bilbo. Enough of your belly aching. Let Bilbo see his friends, so we can end this discussion and go back to ignoring each other. The dwarf said, crossing his thick arms over his equally thick chest. Thranduil sneered. Why should I, dwarf? I came to his rescue. Is that not enough? You came for revenge and self-preservation, elf. Dane snarled back his broad shoulders, tensing. We both know what would happen if someone got the ring from Bilbo. So quit the wounded later, act, Thranduil. You're not fooling anyone here. Father, we cannot keep them apart, said Legolas, chiming in before the king could respond. When his father turned to look at him, he met the other elves' cold stare with his own warm one. Tariel considers him a dear friend. She will not allow even you to end that friendship. Thranduil's eyes widened for a second before his face fell back into the perfect blank mask he was known for. He glanced to Bilbo standing behind Dane, before looking back to his son with an arched brow. When Legolas didn't look away, he finally sighed and dropped his shoulders in defeat. You may visit her and the other two when we get to the palace, the king said in a monotone before turning back to the table that housed his papers and maps. Now leave me. I've had enough of your whining to last me an eternity. Dane snorted and spun around and snagged Bilbo's arm before gently marching him out of the tent. It was only once they were a few feet away that he released his forearm and allowed the hobbit to walk on his own. Well, that was fun. The dwarf lord said, tossing some of his brains over his shoulder. A good reminder for why I hate most elves. Bilbo sighed and nodded. Thank you for your help, Dane. I know you don't like me very much, so this probably won't mean anything, but I do appreciate you stepping in for me like that. Thranduil is a cold leaf eater who has no right to speak to you in the way he did. The dwarf growled, his blue eyes narrowing. He thinks just because one of his people got hurt that he deserves special treatment. Ah, self-absorbed tree ogre. Bilbo rolled his eyes at the rats and began to walk back to the dwarf's camp. And you're wrong, you know, the warrior added as he followed the hobbit. I do like you. If I didn't, then I wouldn't allow you to marry Thorn. You would oppose the marriage? He wondered, glancing back at his companion over his shoulder. They scoffed. No, I would just kill you, assuming this didn't get you first. Somehow, knowing that Dane would go so far for Thorn didn't surprise him. In fact, it actually made him happy that the king had such loyal and caring family members who would resort to murder to protect him. Clearly, my priorities have gone to mortar. Princess, this is someone to fear, then? He asked quietly. Thorin told me she was clever and colder than he. Oh, she is very clever and very ruthless. Dane agreed, grinning with obvious delight. Thorin is a most trustful grump, but he still has a softness to him that he hates, but this? She has none of that. She is as hard as gold as her grandfather was before he went insane. The only warmth she has is safe for her family that she guards vigilantly. She sounds like a fearsome lady, he admitted, biting his lower lip. Do you think she'll like me? Well, you were throwing yourself in front of her sons and brother in battle, and you were even willing to endanger the fate of the world just to get them alive. The dwarf lord mused, rubbing his jaw. I think it's safe to say that she is quite possibly going to adore you. Or at the very least, won't kill you. The next day, they entered Mirkwood and began the trek through the forest. It was strange being back at the forest with the elves guiding them. Mirkwood suddenly seemed less dark and dangerous, even though he knew that wasn't so. There were still spiders around, but they never appeared where the elves walked. Part of them wondered if they recognized the threats or if the elven scouts moved ahead to take them out before they could act. It took a few weeks for them to reach Thranduil's palace. Bilbo found that the closer they got, the more anxious he felt at the thought of seeing his friends. What if they did not wish to see him? What if they were angry at him for failing to destroy the ring? And how in the world was he to handle seeing them injured and scarred because of him? His thoughts continued to plague him, even when an elf came to take him to see his friends. Are you ready, Master Baggins? The elf, a tall male wearing the familiar armor of the guard that Tadiel had favored, 
asked, skillfully ignoring the glares and glowers the dwarves were throwing at him. Ready for what? asked Feli, staring at the elf with the same look that Gloin would give to people who didn't listen to his stories about his son. I'm going to visit Tariel, Bard, and Beorn, he replied, glancing to Thorin, who he had obviously informed to avoid a tantrum. The king nodded back with a cool look on his face that went against the tense line of his shoulders. Would you like one of us to accompany you? Boo considered the thought before slowly shaking his head. No, no thank you. This is something I must do alone. Thorin frowned, but still nodded back. As you wish. We will see you later today, then. I'll be back by nightfall, he promised, brushing his fingers against the dwarves as he walked past. I promise. Good luck, whispered Balin when he passed him. Bilbo gave him a strained smile. Thanks. I'm going to need it. The wounded trio were being housed in a single large chamber that sat in what felt like the middle of the palace. Bilbo tried his best to recall the halls and corridors that he once snuck through for weeks, but his memory failed him. Everything only looked vaguely familiar at best. The most he could remember now was the way back to the entrance. The elf left him at the door with a promise to return later to escort him back to his companions. Then he slipped away with the smooth and silent grace that all elves seemed to possess. With the elf gone, Bilbo found himself alone as he stared down the tall and intimidating door before him. You can do this, Bilbo. If you could face Smog and Sauron and Bomber before he's had his breakfast, you could face your friends, he told himself firmly and actually found that part of him believed it. The other part was calling him a fool and was suggesting that he make a run for it before Bayorn mauled him, but he ignored that part. Then, before he could stop and think, he raised one hand and banged his fist against the solid oak door. There was silence for a moment before a hoarse, familiar male voice granted permission to enter. Bard, he thought, and his heart did a backflip as he finally turned the handle and pushed the massive door open. The room before him was as lovely as the rest of the palace with its graceful architect that only elves seemed capable of making. But he couldn't find himself capable of caring because all of his attention was immediately taken by the three individuals sitting on one of the large beds in the room. Bard was the one who noticed him first. His dark eyes went wide and his mouth dropped open to chalk. Bilbo? Bilbo, you're here? Tariel murmured as a small and familiar smile began to form at her lips. Bayorn simply gazed at him with his warm brown eyes. Bani, you finally came to visit. Oh, Bobo gasped, covering his mouth with one hand as he took in the full extent of the damage done to his friends. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't... I should never have allowed any of you to come with me. You all... You... No, no, little Bonnie. Calm down. Bayorn, who was missing an arm, his actual left arm, from Mint Bicep on one hand, Bobo, down with them, chided with a familiar teasing tone. Don't start getting all broody on us. That's what you turn in into a drive. Oh, Bilbo, please don't cry, pleaded Tariel, who had a white bandage wrapped around her eyes that stood out starkly against her red hair that had been harshly cut and shaved away on one side of her head because someone had clearly tried to put an axe through it as she tilted her head to the side and listened. It really is worse than it looks. Hate to say it, but she's right. Chimed in Bard, grinning at him, even though half his face was bandaged and he was missing an ear. We're actually doing quite fine. I would even say that Tariel's haircut is an improvement for her. Oh, you're so sweet, Bard. Tariel could, reaching out with unnerving accuracy to squeeze his bandaged thigh. So very sweet. You know, I found that the bright side to losing my sight means I don't have to look at your face anymore. With time, I may even forget it completely and save myself some future nightmares. Barn is, then pushed her hand away and tried to scoot away from the elf. It looked rather hard, though, considering he was sandwiched between Baron and Dario. Why do you have to be so violent? This is probably why the wraiths couldn't kill you. Too damn violent. <laughs> no, no, Poppy. Be nice. Bayard chided, gently nudging Bard's leg that he only now realized was missing a foot. Yo, too, Daniel. Our bunny is about to start crying now. How can I not? 
Bilbo sniffed as he tried to hold back from bawling like he wanted to. You're all... Look what's been done to you. The Nazgul have taken something from you all. Well, not everything. Bard replied cheerfully, grinning his boyish grin even though it pulled at the stitched up wound at the corner of his mouth. It didn't take our lives. Bubo finally burst into tears. <laughs>